I think like anything else, sometimes there's messages made just so people can be heard. Sometimes there's an alternate agenda. But I want to tell you, first of all, airway friendly orthodontics is arguably one of the worst terms that you can use. And I've used it in the past myself. I think it's terrible. Looking back in retrospect, uh, I think it was a mistake. Hey, greetings, orthopreneurs. Welcome to another episode of your Five Minute Friday. Now, today, I want to state my case against airway friendly orthodontics. Yeah, you heard me. I want to tell you every reason why I think that's a terrible, terrible term. Um, yeah, term, not process. You know, there's been people out there who've been doing a lot of tacking, but I think this is a, I think this is a topic we need to discuss a little bit because it's really, really interesting. What's worth noting is that there have been calls for, hey, why are people expanding four-year-olds? Why are people doing so many expanders? We should wait. And I get it. I, I just want to reach out and talk about this a little bit because I think like anything else, Sometimes there's messages made just so people can be heard. Sometimes there's an alternate agenda. But I want to tell you, first of all, airway friendly orthodontics is arguably one of the worst terms that you can use. And I've used it in the past myself. Um, I think it's terrible. Looking back in retrospect, uh, I think it was a mistake. And, you know, Peter Dawson, the great educator in dentistry from the Pankey Institute, uh, you know, said, when you quote me, date me. Yeah, it was a term I think many of us used at one point and we made mistakes. But I think it's important to recognize that the concept behind it is not a mistake. And what do I mean by that? Well, I have a good friend who I trust and respect a great deal. And we were talking about uh, expansion and about how this ridiculous story, you know, the conversations that I, la I literally laugh out loud. They're so stupid about what the AAO should or should not allow related to conversations on airway um, about people expanding way too much. And my friend said to me, and he's somebody I really respect a ton, said, I would never expand a three-year-old. I said, okay, well, you have that right. I said, I would never routinely expand a three-year-old. But for those of you out there who've ever worked on a craniofacial team, whether in residency or once you've graduated, ever made a NAM appliance? I made a NAM appliance on a five-day-old once. What does that do? It expands the palate. It, it uh, realigns the alveolar housing so that you can you know, try to deal with a cleft. Oh, but Glenn, that's a cleft patient. Yeah, but if I told you I, was, I would never take an impression on a five-day-old, well, there are times you need to. And by the way, when you take an impression on a five-day-old, uh, if they're crying, they're breathing. So at the end of the day, you can't say I would never expand a three-year-old. There are cases where a three-year-old needs to be expanded. Now, like many arguments out there, the loudest voices often are the least educated on the literature. Right now, Omar Bradley, one of the greatest generals in our history, said, we must navigate by the light of our stars, not by that of every other ship. And that's a great point. Now, what are the stars that we have to align ourselves by? The literature. So when, when, when one goes out there and says, these people, they're, they shouldn't be speaking, they shouldn't be doing it, and, and they happen to work at the most prestigious uh, sleep disorder breathing clinic in the world for decades, uh, you know, Stanford, where one of the main speakers who's been attacked a great deal, speaks, is the number one sleep clinic in the world from every, every metric you can measure, from published literature to studies to uh, patient scene. Guy Mignot, right? Christian Guy Mignot, who started really making that program in notoriety, passed away a couple of years ago. I had a chance to hear him speak, and the guy put Stanford on the map. And I just want to tell everybody out there, if you've learned the literature, and I'm not talking about a weekend course where you spent you know, a day learning literature with a bunch of general dentists. If you really know the literature, if you did a deep dive, like I've been to Stanford sleep disordered breathing lectures for two full weekends already, and I'm not a master by any stretch of the imagination, but I have a pretty good working knowledge of the literature because of them. At the end of the day, are there cases where six-year-olds should be expanded? Absolutely. Should we wait until they're 11 or 12? Absolutely not, right? I wanna tell you about a young lady who came into my office who was about seven years old, and she was wetting the bed, and the family was in distress, and she'd seen a bunch of ENTs. She'd been to her dentist. Her pediatrician said to her, literally, to the mother, I think this is probably from her dyslexia, and if she's not better, if she hasn't stopped wetting the bed by the time she's 12, let's reinvestigate it. Now, you may think this is funny or ridiculous, but this happens literally all the time. And so I'm sitting there with a CBCT in front of me, that shows massive adenoids, huge turbinates, and a super narrow palate. Now, they're not in crossbite. 
But if you know the literature, I think it's out of North Carolina related to superior and inferior convergent maxillas, go look at it. And you'll see that sometimes there's narrow palates that don't dis display a crossbite. The lower arch is completely compensated, right? Rolled in like you might see in a, in a surgical patient. And at the end of the day, this mom is looking at me and saying, I heard you've helped people before. And I say to her, I can't ever guarantee anything, but I'm going to refer you to my ENT, who, by the way, came to Stanford twice with me as well. And he's going to probably refer you to our myofunctional therapist, who, by the way, came to Stanford with us for two weekends as well. Notice the theme here. And so we get this girl triage, so to speak, diagnosed. She has large adenoids. She has large turbinates. They need to be dealt with in some way, shape, or form. The ENT is saying to me, Glenn, based upon everything we learned, I think she should be expanded as well. So I go ahead and I expand. You know what? The girl stops wetting the bed. Now you can make the case that N equals one or a hundred or a thousand or how many patients we've treated and seen this in. But don't sit there and tell me that there's no science behind this because there's a huge amount of science. Go read Harvold. I think it's 1980 or 81. I think it's the AJO. Go read that on facial development and airway, and then let's have the conversation. You need to know the literature if you're going to be in this conversation. And at the end of the day, if people say there's not enough science related to airway, but they're going to sit in the next room in the AAO and lecture on some product or appliance they use that has even less literature, I've got a problem with that. And when, the, when, when we've all heard a thousand times, right, my master's thesis was on maxillary growth and development. Right? So I think I'm pretty well educated on this particular topic. When we've all heard people talk about the famous statement by one of the greatest researchers in ortho, who I respect tremendously, I'm not going to mention names, but you know who he is, and he's amazing, saying, expand the maxilla so the mandible can grow out from underneath it. Right? Mm -hmm. It's okay to expand there, but we can't expand when we cl see clearly a narrow palate and uh, airway-related issues. Again. We need to use common sense related to the literature here. Remember, there was a great paper years ago, Lyle Johnson, amazing, amazing researcher, one of the pioneers in our industry, wrote, growing jaws for fun and profit. You remember that one? Against class two correction and how people were making tons of money on it. And yes, the point was people are using it inappropriately. And that'll always be the case. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you are not a gatekeeper for oral health, I'm sorry to hear that. But when people come into my office, I ask them the scientifically reviewed questionnaire and airway from the University of Michigan, which literally stated in their second paper, in their second paper, literally stated that this questionnaire has been shown to be as accurate in diagnosing sleep disordered breathing and, and obstructive sleep apnea as an in-center sleep study. Think about that for a second. All you have to do is ask four or five questions and you'll have an idea whether a child is suffering or not. And you know what? If they have no symptoms, I don't treat them. But if they are, now let's get them involved with the ENT who, who knows what they're talking about. Let's get them involved with the myofunctional therapist or the oral surgeon or the pediatric dentist or a pediatrician or any number of people who are on my team. So yes, are there people overexpanding? Absolutely. Have I seen people making ridiculous sums of money and charging crazy sums of money to do it? Absolutely. And I can never defend that. But for us to say we shouldn't be talking about it at the AAO. Now, I won't get into the white paper from a, a, a lobbying legal organization that, as far as I know, doesn't really get into science. I won't get into that white paper and what the literature really says about it. But I will tell you, I think the person has to be talking about this AAO. I think people who are pushing the boundaries on it a little bit might sometimes be overstepping. But the ones who are following the literature, right, are not making acts of commission. They're not doing it on purpose. They may be over-treating by, you know, by your standard. But until we have a defined protocol, and the defined protocol to me does not come from the AAO. The defined protocol, because if everybody here says we shouldn't be involved, why does the AAO make the protocol on what should and should not be happening with children? Maybe the AAOHONS, the American Association of Head and Neck Surgery, maybe they should be the ones doing it, which by the way, I just want to give you one last piece of information related to this whole topic. Up until a few years ago, up until a few years ago, the only reason why they, the white paper that they had for head and neck surgeons said the only time you should take out tonsils or adenoids is when you've had repeated number of infections. I think it was seven 
infections or fever within one year or five per year for two years, or whatever the numbers were. And I knew head and neck surgeons who were still doing adenoids and tonsils for airway. And then all of a sudden, about three to four years ago, they changed the paper because the literature substantiated it. For years it substantiated it, but they were very slow in getting there because governing bodies often take time. And suddenly you could address tonsils and adenoids for airway. Imagine that. So the people who knew the literature and had been doing it for years were not the ones who were wrong. And I think we all need to have a little bit of humility, right? The old statement from, uh, what was it, Dr. Malcolm, uh, Ian, whatever his name was from Jurassic Park, your lack of humility before nature is staggering. We need, to, we need to have humility when it comes to the literature, because just like things get attacked a ton, often the loudest voices are the least educated on it. And I would defy you to find anybody who really knows the literature to tell me that we shouldn't be expanding a six-year-old who is also being treated by the ENT at the same time, right? And so, again, I know we often like to throw things back about TMD in ortho, but again, anybody who knows the literature, and again, I spent three years at the University of Washington in a nathological residency, and no, like the stupid statement by one of our pioneers said, you know, nathology is not the study of how articulators work. Once you learn what a balancing interference is and how it creates ipsy and contralateral muscle function, and damages the joint and changes function. So you can end up with clicking and popping and understand this effectively, like many of you have been through raw understand. TMJ or TMD related to ortho and how we can fix it or help it or assist it is a legitimate thing. And so is this airway orthodontics. And again, I hate the term airway friendly orthodontics. I am not an airway friendly orthodontist. I am an orthodontist. And that means I've got a certificate in orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics. And that means I change skeletal patterns and I change teeth. And if I can expand a child who's six years old, whose pediatrician has given up on them, whose family's in terrible pain and going through a lot of trouble, well, I will, especially if I'm part of an interdisciplinary team. And shame on people out there who are causing orthodontists to not want to carry that torch and help when appropriate because they're hearing rhetoric out there that, that throws us back. And so again, if you know of somebody who's doing something you feel they should not be doing, my advice to you is the same I would always say, reach out to them personally. And as Stephen Covey likes to say, seek first to understand, then to be understood, which we don't do enough of. And I'll leave you with this again, like Omar Bradley said, let's navigate by the light of our stars. And the stars are the literature. It's what we've done in orthodontics for years. It's what we continue to do. Let's not go based on emotion. Let's go based on what the literature says. And you have the right to debate on emotion if that's what you want. But now you're navigating by the light of every passing ship. Much love to each and every one of you. Reach out to me if you have any questions. And I uh, can't wait to see you at Summit in September. We've got several stressors in our life. We've got a great profession, but we've got to deal with overhead. We've got to deal with productivity. We've got to deal with team members that are outside of our control sometimes. And the great news is, all of these issues are addressed in depth in this year's curriculum at Orthopreneur Summit. So please go to opsummit2023.com, sign up for the meeting that's almost sold out, that everybody's gonna be talking about, that you really need to be at to be your best practice with the lowest stress and highest profitability. opsummit2023.com, please join me there so that I can take care of you even better than you take care of your patients.